The subject today that I wanted to talk about is a part of the Human Soul series of talks. And the sub part of this uh, discussion is something that I feel has been happening to you for the last six months for many of you. And so I want to talk about them. It begins with the addictions, and uh, we've talked a little before about addictions. But then uh, I'm, uh, I can't even spell still. You see, I haven't improved with my spelling. <laughs> I haven't improved. I have improved in other areas. Uh, addictions and bribery and fear, threats and blackmail. That's a long-winded topic, isn't it? <laughs> Addictions and bribery, fear, threats and background. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you about this subject is I can feel that many of you are still in addictions with regard to your development towards God. And what I wanted to do today is firstly explain to you how addictions interfere with your relationship with God. Does that make sense? And then after we've talked about that, we'll talk about these other aspects of bribery, threats and blackmail, how we emotionally engage these things constantly. What we often do, before we realise it, we're bribing someone emotionally or we're even threatening them emotionally or even we can get to the stage where we're blackmailing them emotionally just to get our addictions met. And so what we want to do today is talk about how our addictions actually call into us all of this very unloving behaviour. And remember, every time we engage in unloving behaviour, we're affecting our soul. Our soul condition is degrading, becoming darker. And it's the addictions actually too that prevent many times our relationship with God. So what I want to do first is just remind you of how the relationship with God is established and it's the same kind of material we've looked at before so if I just rub that out that's our title but it's taken up too much of the board for me to leave there all right so we start with God And here's our, our soul. Oh, this time what I'm going to do, instead of drawing us as half of the soul as I normally would, so if you're a male, that would be the male half of the soul, and if you're a female, that would be the fem feminine half of the soul. Let's just draw us as a... My, this is not very good here, is it? I'll just see if I go with a different rubber. That doesn't work much either. I think we'll discard that pen and go to a different one in my collection. All right, so instead let's draw our true self as a circle. That's me, my true self. Now, my true self isn't the person that I want to look like to everyone else. It isn't the person that I want everybody else to perceive me to be. It's actually the person that God sees. That's our true self. They're then wrapped around our true self. There are just layers of things wrap, wrapping around our true self. You often refer to them as like onion layers that you're digging down through emotionally, right? So the first layer above our true self, and you could say our true self is full of what you would call causal emotions, right? Or emotions that are the emotions, the real emotions that prevent our relationship with God. They're there in that true self. But around our true self, there is a layer generally of fear. Does that make sense? So the fear is blocking us from accessing our true self. Kinds of fears might be, I'm afraid that you might see me as a terribly bad person. And so what I do is I put on, when I'm with you, then I put on a front. So that, so that you see a different person than what I perceive myself to be or of what I really am. Now that's my fear 
that I'm not allowing myself to feel that fear is dictating that action and I'm afraid of you seeing me as I truly am so I now put on the front and the fear is the thing that allows me to put on that front and then what happens with the fears is our fears uh, usually these fears have all created of course during our childhood and our environment creates them and so what happens our fears then dictate the next layer of what happens in our life and the next layer of what happens in our life is our addictions so if I'm afraid of you seeing me as I truly am I then set up a system that I create and I create through this system an addiction I'm addicted to you seeing me differently to what I truly am I want you to see something different than what I see because I'm so terrified about what I see inside of myself and I don't want to feel that and so what I do instead of doing that is I want you to see something completely different to what I feel myself to be and so I set up these addictive interactions with people around me and so I want them to placate that fear that I have the fear of my true self or the fear of seeing myself as I truly am and those addictions go into play then when my addictions are not met I do another thing so this is another circle what is that anger so I start getting angry with my environment somehow and when I say with my environment it is usually the people in my environment that I get the most angry with but sometimes it's with the environment itself isn't it like a mozzie comes along bites you on the arm you're angry with the environment it, the mozzie never met your addiction he shouldn't attack you bang that's also a simple action that is taken out of anger of attack something that ha didn't meet your addictions does that make sense and it, it plays across right across into very, from very simple areas of our life right the through to very complicated areas of our life which we'll talk about as we go on now in amongst all of this God is wanting to have a relationship with us but can you see the problem you see God has her Holy Spirit which is like a conduit that this is us now us not not just our true self but now there's all this stuff now within us and God is trying to connect to us via this connection called the Holy Spirit which is the connection by, via which God it's like a conduit via which God can pump us full of God's love if we have a longing for that love and so we're there longing for this love or thinking we are but we've got all these fears addictions and anger all in place around our true self now God's wanting to connect to our true self in fact the only way God can connect is to our true self does that make sense it's the only way God can connect so this Holy Spirit which is available everywhere in the universe to any person who has a longing for God it cannot connect with us and if there's no connection you remember the Holy Spirit is also a spirit of truth so in other words unless we are in our true self nothing can flow nothing can get in and so what's happening is God's Holy Spirit's there waiting for a connection it's waiting for us to deal with our fears deal with our addiction deal with our anger now God's got a lot of other things in play to help us with those three things and we'll talk about that as we go on but for the moment the main thing to understand is that God's love cannot flow into a soul unless the soul itself is in a position and remember in the course of a day this position may waver so you might have 10 minutes of the day where you're in your true self now in that 10 minutes God can connect with you right but if you're at the rest of the day you're in addictions then God can't connect you there and so you can you see this is why we only receive dribs and drabs of divine love and this is also why many people who have been in Christian religions who have received some divine love get to a certain point where they can't receive anymore 
And the reason why they can't is because these fears, addictions and anger that is all laying, layering around the true self are not being dealt with. And unless they're dealt with, that spirit, Holy Spirit connection cannot be made and the divine love, which is the thing that flows through the Holy Spirit to the person, cannot flow. Can you see how important it is to your relationship with God that fear, addictions and anger are dealt with? Can you see that? Without you dealing with those things, what happens is that the connection with God cannot be maintained and usually what we find happening in the course of a practical day is we might have a little bit of time in the morning, we get a bit of time for ourselves and we pray a bit for, a, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes and in that time we might be connected to our true self and so we receive some divine love. Does that make sense? And then what happens after that? After that what happens is we get out of our true self into some fears, the day kicks in, you know, we have to have the coffee to start the day because now we're a bit bit worried about the day and the day the day kicks in and as the day kicks in and goes progressively further through the day we've got all of these pressures responsibilities day-to-day -day life now affecting our longing for God and a lot of the times we don't realize but a lot of the times we are in our addictions with almost every interaction that happens during the day now in that space our true self is now under buried under these addictions and fears and as a result of that our true self isn't being expressed and we cannot receive God's love during that time and then sometimes by the end of the day we're quite tired sometimes quite emotional by the end of the day we sit down to have a rest and now we're starting to get back in touch with ourselves this is what normally happens for us we start getting in touch with ourselves to a degree and as that happens, we start to reconnect with our true self, the real person we are. And we feel, oh, that was an overwhelming day. And you feel a bit emotional about that, perhaps, or a bit sad about it, maybe even might cry about it, or there might be other things occurring as well. And as a result of that, you are now getting back in touch with your true self and some more divine love can flow in that day. Now, if you look at your 24 hours, so we've got 24 hours, how many minutes is that? Yeah. Anyone's good at maths? It's times by 60, isn't it? So what's that? What is it? Well, do we have to do long multiplication on the... Do we have to do a maths <laughs> class now forever? Do we? Right. It's 24 by 6. What's 24 by 6? 1, 4, 4, eight. That's how many minutes there are in a day. All right. Mm. And how many of those minutes did I say we were connecting with God? 10, maybe 20. So how, how's that as a ratio? 20 out of 1440. That, that's, that's not very much, is it, really, when you look at it in terms of the slice. Now, you know what we often do with that? We often go, 10 years later, we go, God, I've been searching for you for 10 years. No, you've been searching for God 20 minutes of the day for 10 years. Basically, that's what's been happening. So we need to address that. So this is what's going on with us most of our, most of our lives. So we want to stop this process. We want to get to a place where we're in our true self most of the time. Can you see that? And to do that, we're going to have to understand some things about ourselves. We're going to have to understand our fears. We need to understand our addictions. And we need to understand the reasons for our anger. Can you see? And if we can start getting into those things, then some divine love will flow. Now, there's a lot of people who talk about God's love and they say, no, no, that none of what AJ is saying there is true. What it is is, God's love automatically deals with all of those things. And I want to tell you that that's not true. It's not true that God's love automatically deals with those things. In fact, a uh, hundred years or so ago, when we channeled to James Paget, I actually wrote a message to James Paget about this. And I'd just like to read it to you. All right? 
This is what it says. I am here, Jesus. I desire to write tonight on the subject of how the redeemed soul is saved from the penalties which sin and error has brought upon it. When the soul is in a condition of sin and error, in other words, when the soul has all of these things going on inside of its causal true self and all of these different things that motivate its actions out of harmony with love, and remember all sin is, is disharmony with love. That's all sin is. So when we talk about sin, we're talking about the disharmony with love in our soul. When the soul is in a condition of disharmony with love, it is not responsive to the inflowing of the Holy Spirit. And in order to get into condition of receptivity to these influence, it must have an awakening as to its actual condition of enslavement by these things. In other words, while we have all of these things in play, we are not open to the reception of divine love through the Holy Spirit. We're not open to the connection. If we're not open to the connection, we've got to have some other kind of awakening to get us open to the connection. Does that make sense? The divine love itself doesn't open our connection. We have to be open first before the divine love can flow into our soul. I said, until such an awakening comes to it, there is no possibility of it receiving the love of God into it. And in turning its thoughts to the truths of God and to the practices of life that will help it in its progress towards the condition of freedom. So while this state, while I am blind, while I'm blind here and also here to what fears I have, what addictions I have and the anger that I have buried inside me, while I'm blind to all of that, I am in a condition of unreceptivity. I am in a condition of resistance to God. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? And by the way, feel free to ask any questions as we go. So does everyone that make sense? So while I'm in that state all blocked up, the divine love cannot flow into my soul. It's only those moments in time when I'm unblocking and seeing something, that's the moment in time. Peter, you, if we can have a mic there. You don't need to turn it on. It's already on. Oh, did you? That's not how you turn it on. It's best to just leave them on. That's it. AJ, how, how does that relate to prayer then as being the main, the main one of the, the most important ways to, to connect to God? And, and also, how does, how does what you're uh, explaining relate to um, the orthodox Christian view of creating a connection to God? All right. Well, firstly, let's address prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is the sincere and pure longings of the soul, the true self, towards God. Now, can you say that you have sincere longings when you've got a heap of fear, a heap of addictions in play and a lot of anger inside? Now, obviously, there's less effectiveness there, isn't there? If we, if we start addressing the fears, addictions and anger, we can have some pure longings. And remember, prayer is the pure longing of the soul. It's not the soul going, oh, I think I'll have a prayer with God. I'll just sit down for 10 minutes and I'll ask for God to give me this or give me that or do this for me or do that for me. Without me facing myself, God requires that you face yourself in the process. And that's what prayer is in the end. Prayer is the longings of your soul in its pure state. And that only happens, for most of us, a few minutes of the day. And to be honest, how many of you feel divine love flowing every minute of the day? Like, it's very rare, isn't it? And in fact, to get to that point, you have to be actually at one with God. That's the time when you're at one with God, you will actually have divine love flowing every minute of the day. And what I'm trying to explain to you today is what's blocking that love from flowing every minute of the day. And it's these things the fear, addictions and anger. It's the lack of the awakening that I mentioned in the pageant messages. When I said, until such awakening comes to it, there is no possibility of receiving divine love. So you can pray all you like in terms of the physical act of talking to God, but the prayer is not going to reach any further than your brain and the waves that come out of it because it can't unless it's pure. God connects with the pure soul, the one, and often there's a words that we use, the repentant soul and all of those other kinds of terms we might use, and that's the connection that God maintains. Now the second question, Peter, I can't remember, so you have to, if you can remember it for me. 
the second question was, well, how does that relate to uh, Orthodox Christianity right. and, and people going along to church and, and, and believing that they're in the zone and they're praying and connecting and, yep. I'm, I mean, are, are they? <laughs> well, obviously there are times, like you go to, if you go along to, how many of you have been along recently to some Pentecostal church or something like that? How many? Just a few, okay. It's interesting when you go along because there are times when you can see God's love is flowing into the individual's present. And that's the times usually when their emotions are free and open and they have a deep longing. Most of the time it's happening when they're singing or some kind of uh, thing like that is going on and they're feeling really emotional towards God, feeling a lot of desire and love for God and in that moment divine love flows into their soul. So in that moment, divine love flows. But in most other moments of their life, they're not in that state. And therefore, divine love cannot flow in, in, a, in any other state than that state. And what I'm saying to you today is these are the reasons why divine love doesn't flow all the time to most people. It's because they're unwilling to have the awakening as to the perception of their true self, of their true nature, what's really going on inside of them. They're unwilling to actually awaken to what the error is present inside of them. If I can continue reading this, because it's, I said, I would not have mankind believe that any soul is compelled to stay in this condition of slavery to sin until the Holy Spirit comes to it with the Father's love to bestow it in all abundance. For the mission of the Holy Spirit is not to awaken man's soul to a realisation of sin and death. So the mission of the Holy Spirit isn't to awaken man's soul, but merely to bring the divine love to the soul when the soul is ready to receive it. That's the mission of the Holy Spirit. The soul has to be gotten by us into a, through our free will into a state where we can receive divine love. When we're in a state where we can receive it, the Holy Spirit makes a connection to our soul. Once it makes a connection to our soul, what happens? Now the, Holy, the, Holy, the connection is made, the conduit is established, the divine love flows into our soul. That's what happens. The awakening, in other words, the awakening to these things, the sin and error that exists within the soul, the awakening must come from other causes that influence the mind as well as the soul and cause them to realise that the life man lives is not the correct life or the one in accord with the demands of the law of God or with the real longings of their own hearts and souls. Let me illustrate. Today or last week, how many of you actually did what you really wanted to do? Really wanted to do? The whole week? A few? Yeah. Now, can you see straight away that most of us are ready to do things we don't want to do? Why is that? The reason why is because we have addictions. We, we believe, we have belief systems in play, false beliefs, they're all false beliefs by the way, we have false belief systems in play that tell us, I've got to work 40 hours, otherwise, what's the fear? I won't have enough money to pay my mortgage. And I'm driving along to work and I'm going, whoa. Each kilometre I drive, my heart sinks a bit, right? For many of us, that's the way it is when we drive to work because we don't really want to go to that job. Right? So what are we doing to go to that job? We are further and further detuning from our true self. Does that make sense? And by the time we got to the work, we are now totally out of harmony with our true self because what does our true self want to do it's screaming at us saying i don't want to be here anymore i don't want to be here anymore i want to go and do something else that's what it's saying right but we are too afraid or we're too much in our addictions to go and embrace a life that we're passionate about and as a result of all that we enjoy and so as a result we stay doing the fear-based thing out of an addiction does that make sense and as we stay doing the fear-based thing out of the addiction, can God connect to us in that place? No, not anymore. Karen, you'd like to, if you have a mic, just down.
I used to really want to do a lot of things, and now I find that I don't have the desire, and I don't know why that happens. Yep. Um, a lot of times what happens when we first start hearing the divine truth, we go through this really strange stage, right? And the strange stage is we, we almost feel that our fears kick in, actually, because we're so afraid of disappointing God in some way that we don't do anything at all. We're like a person who's so afraid to actually go out and do what we desire. We're so worried that our desires might be out of harmony with truth or out of harmony with love that we, we actually decide, oh, I'm not going to do that and I won't do that because that's got this even. Instead of just doing it still and actually bringing our desires into harmony with the love, we have a tendency then to avoid the process of acting. And that is what suppresses those desires that we used to have. Also, at the same time, what is going on is we start recognizing, oh, I used to really like doing that, you know, like I used to really like eating lots of ice cream. You know, you know the story that I've already told you. Like, I get a four litre tub of ice cream, cut it into fours with a knife, bring out one litre <laughs> on the plate, pour it over with the topping, that was my dinner. Right? I didn't believe in having, like, I, I believed in having ice cream before dinner, like, well, if you think about it, it makes sense. You know, you've got the most room for the thing you like the most. But anyway, so, so, so what I was doing there is just, I, I, I was in this place where I was just enjoying eating my ice cream. And then, uh, you know, as you progress, you go, oh, you know, oh, I wonder how they produce this ice cream. <laughs> all right, you know, like, and you go through all of that and you have a look in the internet, you investigate all of those things and you come out, wow, they, you know, they kill all these calves and they all go off to the slaughter and this all happens and that all happens and then they feed these cows this thing and a lot of them are kept in these little booths and by this, time, by this my conscience is now starting to bother me about this ice cream, right? So now I'm not feeling good about eating my ice cream that I used to enjoy, right? So, uh, but I still want to have it because it tastes nice still and everything else is still going on. So, so I'm going through this phase where I, I'm thinking things like, what do I do? What do I do with that particular thing or that particular thing, you know? And, and so a lot of times I start getting myself really mixed up with my desires and passions. The key is to not do that. The key is to go ahead with your desires and passions but keep them in harmony with love or bring them into harmony with love. And in fact, if you allow God to help you with this process, which we'll talk about in a minute how that happens, your fears and addictions will all be get dealt with and your life will automatically come in harmony with love, but you'll be passionate doing things. So you'll actually find, if you're finding right now that you're quite sort of down, depressed and not really getting much accomplished, that's because you're afraid to act and that's a fear. That's not uh, a thing to do with your true self. Does that make sense to everyone? So my suggestion, Karen, is there's two things happening. One that I'm first in the state where I'm afraid to act because I'm afraid that one of the things I act in might actually be in disharmony with one of God's laws and I'm afraid of somehow getting punished. And I need to deal with that fear because God's not a punishing God. I just need to feel the results of every action that I take. Secondly, sometimes at the beginning my conscience bothers me and so then I stop doing the things that I used to desire but I don't replace those desires or merge those desires into love. And we need to do both of those things. I'll just keep reading this. It says, until this awakening comes to the soul, comes, the soul is really dead so far as to having a consciousness of the existence of the truths or of its redemption is concerned. And such death means continuance of the thoughts of evil and sin, which are all related to our fears and our addictions and our anger and rage, in the life which leads only to, to condemnation and death for long, long years, it might be. So, so what often happens is because we have these things in play and we're wanting to maintain a sense of blindness to them, what we finish up doing is we allow years to go past. And years and years go past and we, we really make very little progress in love. One of the questions I was going to ask you earlier was, how many of you feel you've progressed in the demonstration of your love in the last six months? 
So how many of you feel that? So quite a number. That's it's really lovely. Some of you haven't actually progressed. In fact, some of you have regressed in the demonstration of your love in the last six months. And you, you can feel that too. You feel that in your soul. And the reason why, the only reason why we can make progress is because we start addressing the awakening of our soul. The awakening of our soul, seeing ourselves as we truly are. And in fact, in the end, remember, we've talked in the past about other things, but one of the things is seeing ourselves as God sees us, warts and all. all right? That's what we need to see. And of course, God looks down and sees us, warts and all, and still loves us and knows our pure, the pure part of our soul that's in there. So God still feels that for us. But God also sees the fear that you have and God sees the addictions that you have and God sees how you were unloving here and how you were unloving there and what you did last week that was unloving to your partner or your neighbour or your child. God sees all those things too. And what we need to do is come to see the same things because if we saw them, we probably wouldn't do them anymore. That's why we need to see them. And unless we see them, we, we will not have the awakening we need to have. But come nearer to the point of my discourse, I said, this was 100 years ago, the soul that is existing in sin and error will have, sooner or later, to pay the penalties for such sin and error. And there is no escape from the payment of these penalties except in the redemption that the Father provided by the new birth. So in other words, I can stay in these sin and error, in the addictions, the anger, the rage, the fear, and not deal with any of those for as long as I desire. God has given me the free will to make that choice. So God has allowed me to choose to remain in that place for as long as I want. However, there is penalties associated with staying in those places because every one of these things creates actions and creates words and deeds that, that actually damage your environment and damage yourself. So at the end of the day, we just get darker if we do that. Right? We don't want to do that if we really want to get closer to God. These penalties are only the natural results of the operation of God's laws and they must be endured until the full penalty is paid. Even though a man may progress to a higher condition of soul excellence and have such happiness, yet he must pay the last farthing and thus release himself from these penalties. So in other words, these penalties, these things here, which are not just our, the results of our own sin or missing the mark with regard to love but they are also the result of the sins or the missing of the mark of love of our environment right so we grew up in an environment that is already unloving for most of us you look at our day-to-day -day actions as a collective human race right right now in japan there's got they've got the issues with the nuclear reactors right well who ever thought of building a nuclear reactor in the first place it, it, does that seem to be a loving thing that something could go wrong and actually cause the destruction of thousands, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people? Can you see it was born from an unloving decision in the first place and in the end from a fear, the creation of those things? And we're now dealing with the consequences of that fear being expressed and turned into actions, right? And in particular, the Japanese people have had a history of the consequences of that in their lives, have they not? And yet, as a, na as, as a world, we do not learn. Why? Because we want to remain blind to ourselves. We don't want to have the awakening we need to have to make the changes that need to occur. Does that make sense? 